session for today. I just want to thank you all for being here for Coffee with the Curator. And um, I wanted to plug the next Coffee with the Curator, which is December 12th. Um, and it is going to be given by our Associate Curator, Rachel Holstein. And it is on the eight and new American painting, or new American art. So her talk will cover eight artists that were fundamental in early 20th century American art. And it kind of corresponds to the exhibition that we have up right now, American Realism. So if you haven't had an opportunity to see the show, I recommend seeing it multiple times. But after her talk, you'll learn a lot more about some of the artists in that exhibition. That's December 8th. Or I'm sorry, it's December 12th. And I'd like to thank Big Beef as our sponsor for Coffee with the Curator. Um, they are the ones to give thanks to for the coffee and the donuts and all of the snacks. Um, so thank you, Big Beef. Uh, to get into today's lecture, you know, I didn't think about this when I was planning it, but what a kind of macabre topic for October. So maybe it's a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> it was not intentional, but uh, today I thought, oh, this is great. It's it's grotesque, um, <laughs> which is something I, I am drawn to in art. I, I like art that makes people kind of question things or maybe makes you cringe. So this topic is is near and dear to my heart, which, what does that say about me? But um, <laughs> welcome to Coffee the Curator. Today we're going to talk about Judith and Holofernes. And we're going to look at a number of different depictions of Judith and Holofernes. But the whole exhibition, or the whole lecture really, is based around an artwork that you could see here at the FIA. So this, um, this subject is illustrated in this large painting in our Summerfield Gallery um, that depicts this epic story. So we're going to get into what that story is, how artists have represented Judith over the years, and a little bit more in depth with our artist, uh, Gregorio, Lazarini. So, the painting that we see on the screen here is uh, by Lazarini. He was an Italian painter. He lived from 1657 to 1730. He had quite a prolific career. Uh, he was born in Venice. His mother was a really prolific painter as well. So it kind of ran in the family. And he was known for a variety of subjects, like many artists at that time. He was um, known for portraiture, mythological, religious, and historical scenes. And so artwork by Lazzarini has a very classical feel with a little bit of Baroque drama. So let's look at a couple other artworks by Lazzarini. Many of these are located in museums, specifically in Venice or in Italy. So here are two different paintings by Lazzarini. You can see that there's a similar style. The bodies are very highlighted. Um, the landscape is focused, and there's really a beautiful mix between figures and landscape. So interestingly enough, the image on the left is depicting Ronaldo and Armida, which we have next to the Summerfield Gallery in the beautiful gray tapestries. So the story of these two is depicted in uh, our gray gallery as well. So we have images from a Renaissance poem, then we have Orpheus um, and the Bacchanats. Uh, this is a Greek story about the end of Orpheus's life. Then you know we have biblical depictions, we have David and Goliath, one of the most popular, I think, images that we see in religious artwork at this time, outside of depictions of the Virgin Mary and Jesus. And then we have Jael and Sisera. This is another biblical story. So the, the image on the right kind of alludes to the violence that we're going to see in our depictions of Judith. And some historians even argue that Judith and Jael are a, a combined story, that they have a lot of similarities. So beyond his own painting, Lazzarini was an incredibly successful teacher. He is best known for having trained Giambattista Tipolo, 
who is a really well-known uh, painter from the Rococo period. The Rococo art, you tend to see a lot of, I kind of like think of it as frilly details and wispy brush strokes and pastel colors. And I'm not gonna show you any of Tupelo's work today, but you can see some of that influence even creeping in with Lazzarini's artwork. The delicate way he paints the pearls or her hair, that kind of seeps into this next style. So he's an artist that kind of lingers between various different periods or styles in art history. He joined the Painters Guild in Venice in 1687, and his style was really relatively traditional for that time. And as he progressed as an artist, he maintained a traditional or classical style, but then he added some elements of the time, like Baroque shading, a really high contrast between light and dark, or really rich colors. But it's interesting for him as an artist, we can't we can't put him in one category. He kind of stylistically fits in multiple different categories, which is another reason that makes him so prolific. He can kind of do it all. But his painting of Judith and Holofernes is really what we're here to talk about today. This painting became part of the museum's collection in 2011. Highly recommend after this talk, just head down to Summerfield and check it out so you can get really close and see some of those beautiful details. Before we talk a little bit about our painting though, I wanna give you the story of Judith because I think it sets the stage for everything that we're going to look at today. So the story of Judith and Holofernes is recounted in the book of Judith. This is a second, second century text that is deemed apocryphal by Jewish and Protestant traditions, so it typically won't be found in those um, texts but it is included in many Catholic editions of the Bible. And you can find, if you're interested in, in reading the story, you're not familiar with it, you can find all of the text online, and it's a really cool story to read. So like David and Goliath, it was a really popular subject in the history of art. It became popular in the medieval period, and depictions of Judith at that time were very um, honorific, which um, she, was, she was depicted as this incredible, virtuous heroine. Um, this changes a little bit throughout time, but they're very popular in the medieval period, into the Renaissance, and into the Baroque period. Then once we get toward modern art, we don't see as many depictions of Judith. Um, but when we do see them, they're quite dynamic. So a little bit about the story. It was also really popular in literature, theater, and music. So it's not just visual arts that we see in this story. Um, the story basically goes, an Assyrian king named Nebuchadnezzar sent his armies out to infiltrate uh, all of the Israelite towns and kind of take over. And he sent his first major general, whose name was Holofernes, on an expedition to take over cities, kind of systematically gain power. And one of the cities that they planned to attack was a city called Bethulia. And that's what you're looking at in this image, is Bethulia is in the distance, and you have Holofernes' army, or Nebuchadnezzar's army, really, in the foreground, or the midground, and then in the front you can see Judith. So as they were moving across the country, or moving across the land, capturing cities, uh, another general warned Halifernes about Bethulia. He said that something, nothing good will come of this. You should probably not attack them. But of course, Halifernes was going to do what Nebuchadnezzar wanted, and so they prepared to attack the city. The army was huge, approximately 182,000 people, and what they did is they surrounded the city gates and they cut off all of the water supply. So slowly, people are unable to get water, fresh water, and they're really suffering. All of the people of Bethulia are, are suffering. 
And the city officials are at their wit's end. They don't know what to do. And so they basically decide that they're going to surrender. So in three days, they're going to surrender. They'd rather, said they'd rather be slaves to Nebuchadnezzar than to die of thirst. And Judith, who was a wealthy uh, widow, heard of this, and she really believed that God would save her people. And she decided that she was gonna do something about it. So, she, Judith is described as a young, a beautiful young widow, and um, I can't stress how many times in the text they talk about her beauty. And that comes into play when we look at some of the paintings. So she reaches out to the city officials and kind of chastises them and said that they, she should believe in God and his plan. She said to them, listen to me. I will perform a deed that will go down from generation to generation among our descendants. Stand at the city gate tonight and let me pass through with my maid. And within the days you have specified before you will surrender the city to our enemies, the Lord will deliver Israel by my hand. You must not inquire into the affair, for I will not tell you what I am doing until it has been accomplished. And the city official said, okay, we'll, we'll let you go and, and do this. And so she goes back to her house and she puts on her best clothing. Um, she gathers some drink and food and her and her maid servant exit the city walls and they go to talk to the opposing army. And I can't stress this enough, she is dressed so beautifully and she is so beautiful that everyone was kind of enamored with her. So she basically pretends to flee her city and turn over her people to the uh, to Holofernes. And so she tricks them to thinking that, that they're actually, she's gonna actually help them. So she's going to tell Holofernes how he can be victorious, how he can infiltrate the city and take it over right away. She doesn't tell him that though right away. And he is smitten with her. And so a couple days pass, and she is living amongst the enemy army. And one night, this is the third night, he decides to have a large banquet dinner with all of his servants. And he ends up getting incredibly intoxicated. He goes back to his tent with Judith. And she, this was kind of her plan, was to get him intoxicated. And he thinks that something sexual is going to happen, and he's very excited. He's lusted after this woman since he saw her, and she has other plans. <laughs> so he goes back to the tent, and he passes out. And Judith finds the opportunity to pick up his sword and cut his head off. So she takes the decapitated head back to Bethulia and goes to the city officials and says, here's, here's Holofernes, General Holofernes' head, put it up on the parapets to show the army what, what we have done, what God has done. Of course, remember, all of this is through God. And the enemy army loses it, and they, they retreat. And so her city is saved. And the story of Judith goes far and wide throughout her life, and then, of course, past that. So that's what artists are picking up on, is this incredible story. And a couple, there are a couple reasons why this particular story is popular. Um, and it aligns with some other biblical stories that are popular at the time. So this story is an example of a lot of different things. And it is attractive to, to artists for, for some of these reasons. First of all, Judith is the ultimate underdog. She's a woman, she is a widow, she is young and beautiful, and she single-handedly takes on an entire army. If that's not an underdog story, you know, I don't know what is. Um, people often compare the story of Judith and Holofernes with the story of David and Goliath. David and Goliath is also another really popular uh, narrative that you see in the history of art. 
This is also a story that talks about the victory of virtue over vice. Um, she maintained her composure throughout the entire experience with Holofernes. One of the things she said when she came back, she made it clear to her city people that he was attracted to her face and nothing else happened. So she maintained her celibacy after her husband died until her death. And so this idea of virtue over vice, you can see the army as lustful, vengeful, angry, and she is the kind of opposite of that. And then of course, some have even, uh, some people think of this as a story about protection of God's chosen people. And in the text, over and over again, it mentions this, how God is there to protect them. He's giving Judith strength. And, and it's a really uh, story that emphasizes heavenly belief. Sometimes, and at different points in history, the story of Judith has also been paralleled to the story of the Virgin Mary and the extension of the church as well. So the, the narratives are not similar, but what Judith meant in her devotion to God and the Virgin Mary, there, there are some at points, certain points in history that are parallels. Um, this, is, this connection is particularly important when the Catholic Church was engaging in conflicts with both the Protestants and the Ottoman Turks, which they culturally aligned with Nebuchadnezzar's army. So it becomes a little political at some point, the story of Judith. And we will see a, kind of a visual connection between Judith and the Virgin Mary as we look at some artists' representations. So in general, that is the story of Judith and the story of Judith and Holofernes. Now, I'll go back to this etching really quickly, or um, engraving really quickly. And I think this particular artwork is really fascinating because when you see images of Judith, most often it is her, her maidservant, and maybe Holofernes or his head. Uh, but this one actually kind of gives you a whole overview. So when you're thinking of the story and you're thinking about the, the monumental task that Judith took on, this image kind of helps you understand that there, it's not just her and Holofernes, it's her, she's got a whole army she's got to be aware of. And of course, Holofernes. And you see Judith down in the corner, kind of looking over her shoulder while she's dropping his head into her maidservant's bag. And then you see Holofernes' body in the tent behind. So we're, we're gonna pop back and forth with our painting, um, but Lazzarini really embraced the narrative of this story. Um, and in this case, he kind of showcases two different elements that are important to the story or the interpretation of Judith. Femininity and violence. So according to the book of Judith, her incredible beauty was a key factor in infiltrating the enemy. And what Lazzarini has done here is showed us a very beautiful woman. So if you look at the painting here, she is uh, very young or youthful, uh, no wrinkles or anything like that. She's a, a young woman who is wearing an incredibly beautiful gown that is um, expensive, of course. And her dress kind of simultaneously clings to her body and then, then hides her body. Now, in particular, if we look up at the top of her chest, her entire chest is exposed. We almost see, uh, we see a nipple there too as well, which is not uncommon for depictions of Judith. But it's emphasizing this beauty and, and sexuality of this young woman. So this expanse of skin across her chest acts as a background for a string of pearls. This string of pearls kind of delicately wraps across her shoulder and snakes down in between her breasts. Again, kind of alluding to beauty and seduction. Uh, pearls though, pearls symbolize, typically symbolize purity and integrity. So while this is very beautiful, we are also reminded of Judah's purity and her devotion to God and to her people. 
She's kind of pulling away a little bit as she is taking the head of Hello Fermi's in the bag and putting it in the bag. And um, it's as if she is maybe kind of disgusted by what's happening, although her face does not show any disgust. Lazarine has painted her face in a very serene manner, maybe once again to emphasize her beauty. But her body is kind of pulling away, you know, she's getting rid of that head. So that gesture kind of reinforces this clash between her delicate femininity and the act that just took place, this, and, and the deep devotion she had to her city to go through with something like this. He doesn't let you forget the rest of the, this part of the story. So we are looking at the moments after she has decapitated Holofernes, and she is putting the head into the bag. Now, the bag is being held by her maidservant. Her maidservant is kind of obscured a little bit, so you don't see her full face. But if you look at the two women in comparison, Judith is much more elaborately adorned and much more kind of classically beautiful than her maidservant. Once again, kind of amping up that feminine element. But the, the maidservant has been an integral part of the story, so Lazarini kept her in. And of course, we don't forget about, we can't forget about how Fernies, because this is where we see the violence and the gruesome nature of the story. So he doesn't allow us to completely forget about Holofernes' death. First of all, we see the head being placed into the bag. But what you see behind her is his body kind of splayed out like a rag doll. And uh, Lazarini has chosen to put that body very close to the, to the viewer. So we are right next to his, his arm and where his head would have been. So Lazzarini is reinforcing the gruesome nature of this by not trying to hide it. If you look at this image, we, we barely see that his head has been cut off from the body. Lazzarini says, here it is, right there, pay attention. Um, Halifernie's fingers are bathed in light and they kind of appear to point toward the sword and this is kind of an indicator of his own demise. As I said, make sure to check the painting out in person because you can, you can see a lot of these fine details. So it's a reminder of the violence that just took place. Now, this, pic this story has been depicted in many different ways and according to many different interests or concerns of the time, and both interests of the patrons or the artist. So there is a lot of uh, a lot of different interpretation of this story and a lot of different symbolism. So she's often depicted in one of two ways. I would argue that Lazzarini kind of balances some of these. So some artists tend to emphasize the femme fatale of Judith. The femme fatale is a sexually dangerous woman. This archetype has existed in art and literature for years. Um, think of Medusa, Cleopatra, a little bit, Salome, Delilah. There's these very beautiful women that are very dangerous, can be very dangerous. This archetype, you know, is, is quite popular, and some artists embrace that femme fatale aspect. Although the story of Judith and Holofernes was depicted since the Middle Ages, we really see a lot more of the femme fatale in more modern representations uh, or late Baroque representations of the story. She becomes a little bit more suggestive and a little bit more aggressive. And this is a good example here, um, Gustav Klimt's version. And I'll talk about this a little bit more detail later. So the next kind of trope of uh, Judith is a femme forte, or a strong and virtuous woman. <laughs> Judith was a popular subject, sometimes depicted as even a saint or a goddess. Um, she was considered virtuous, especially in the text when it talks about her celibacy through her husband's death. Um, it also, as I mentioned before, she's sometimes aligned with the Virgin Mary, with her purity. 
And so we'll see artists playing around with that in this strong, virtuous uh, woman, as opposed to kind of a sexually dangerous woman. But sometimes she's depicted as something in between those two or something else. So I want to take a little, little bit of time, just a few minutes here, and look at some other depictions of Judith. Not to forget ours, just to think about how ours might lie somewhere in the middle. Now, this is all up for your interpretation. I'd love to hear your ideas at the end. But we see in this particular artwork a really different type of Judith than what we just saw in ours. So to start off with, some artists choose different moments in the story. They might show after the decapitation, they might show before, or they might show during. But usually if you're looking at an image of Judith, it has something to do with that particular moment in the story. That is the moment when they became, she became victorious. So Lucas Cranach the Elder started, um, his, his depiction of Judith kind of aligns with what we see a lot at this time period. So starting in the early 1500s, artists would transform her from a relatively simply dressed goddess. I don't have any medieval depictions of Judith, but she looks very traditional, like a goddess figure. And in the 15th century, we start to see them sometimes depicted, depicting her as a noble woman. So this particular image is kind of, kind of interesting because she's wearing a very extravagant outfit. But it's not an extravagant outfit from the time of Judith. It is an extravagant outfit for, for the 16th century. And so if you think about, if we were to remake this in, in our time, Judith might be wearing a sweatshirt or something like that. <laughs> so it really modernizes her by depicting her in this up to the moment fashion. And she is decked out. She's even got gloves and beautiful necklace of course referencing her, her wealth and her beauty, but in a very contemporary way. And um, this probably would have happened because of his patrons. So this was common at the time if an artist was painting something for a patron to really kind of fine tune it into their likes or dislikes. And so the patron was more than likely very excited to see Judith in all of this contemporary finery. So there's minimal amount of gore in this image. Um, you know, his head is kind of resting down on the table. And so again, this might have been something that would have been appeasing or appealing to her, to the patron of this painting. So sometimes we see contemporary fashion. We see a very composed woman. I also look at her posture. It's as if she's sitting for a portrait. That was the case. <laughs> Botticelli is um, much more traditional Renaissance style. Uh, of course, Botticelli, very well-known Renaissance artist. And he has a very distinct style. Um, the figure in the center, which is Judith, it has a long kind of serpentine body. So it's kind of long, beautiful, elegant curves. The clothing clings to her and kind of wisps around her. You almost imagine the wind in the scene. Judas' maid servant is behind her. Um, and then, of course, Holofernes is being held. Uh, the model for this was likely uh, Simonetta Vespucci, which was a noble woman that uh, Botticelli used in many of his paintings. So if she looks familiar, there's a reason. Uh, she's wearing blue. Um, Lazzarini's painting, the, the depiction of Judith is also wearing blue. And blue is a color that we typically see in depictions of the Virgin Mary. So there's that visual connection between the two. Her clothing is a little bit more traditional, kind of Greek or Roman inspired, which is typical of the Renaissance. And uh, Botticelli was from Florence. And he may have been influenced by other trends that were happening in Florence, in particular other regions of Italy as well. 
So in the early and high Renaissance, some interpretations of the story of Judith and Holofernes became political. And I kind of touched on that a little bit with the church, but this becomes more political in terms of the government. Um, she became a symbol of uh, underdog, she was an underdog, and so a lot of artists understood her kind of almost aligned with the Florentine Republic, which was trying to gain a stronghold against these really wealthy individuals who kind of wanted to rule Florence for themselves. So we see a lot of depictions of David in Florence because David is, again, an underdog, and the Florentine Republic who saw themselves as that. And so perhaps Botticelli is playing around with that. Um, if he's not particularly in this painting, other artists do. Okay, so this is uh, Andre Matania, and this is Judith kind of as the bringer of justice. So I showed you this when I was talking about her as a femme forte. So she is, there's so much in this painting that kind of references classical, the classical period, so the Greek and the Roman period. Again, Matania was a Renaissance painter, and so that was the prevailing style of the day. But she's depicted in very classical clothing. It's uh, kind of draped across her. She's not like the image that we saw wearing the contemporary outfit. And um, she's striding out of the tent, kind of, or standing in this really confident manner with a very projected knee. So that's again another classical reference. The phrase is called, or the term is called contrapposto. And it's a very common stance that you see in Greek and Roman sculpture. And the Renaissance artists brought that back um, with a vengeance. And so she's standing like a classical figure, almost like a Greek goddess. And even her profile is reminiscent of Greco Roman sculptures. And so Matania is very clearly going back to a classical reference. Um, and that often alludes to power and justice and you know, analytics. Um, and so she's kind of depicted here as the bringer of justice. Um, powerful, maybe noble woman trope because a lot of people saw the height of the civil, at the time, a lot of people saw the height of civilization as the Roman, Greek and Roman period, Roman Empire specifically. So there's a lot of classical references here, again, to after she has decapitated Goliath. But we get to the Baroque period and things change a little. <laughs> so we start to see violence very clear. Um, so Caravaggio. And this is typical of Baroque art if you, you know, are familiar. It's, they love this stuff and they love it for a reason. So now we start to see a much more violent depiction of the story of Judith and Holofernes. During the Baroque period, um, the, this story became an opportunity for artists to explore violence and gore and drama. It's, this is not applicable just to this subject. You see quite a bit of this throughout Baroque art. So Caravaggio is one of the most notorious artists of this time period. And um, he illustrates the moment of greatest tension. This whole story is, is dramatic, but when you think about the arc of the story, this is the, the apex. And you know, will Judith be able to follow through with her plan? Will it work? That's another question. And so we are at that moment where we are realizing, yes, it probably will, but this is the moment during, not the moment after. And so artists like Caravaggio play up the drama by showing us the most dramatic moment in the narrative. He also amplifies the drama of the story visually. So he is known for his very, very obvious contrast between light and dark, um, we call it tenebrism. So it is this stark contrast that almost kind of feels like you're looking at a stage. And uh, Caravaggio is a master of this, of course. Um, at the time, Judith is also kind of often depicted more as like an assassin than a, a virtuous or seductively dangerous woman. 
seductive, sorry, seductively dangerous woman. So notice how he distinguish, distinguishes between Judith and her maidservant. The idea of beauty, I think, is amplified really heavily in this. So we, again, the story notes how beautiful she was, and he has her depicted as a young woman, and right next to her, almost next to her face, is her maidservant, who is significantly older. And so visually here, we are reminded of the story, of the beautiful heroine of the story. And I would argue maybe a little more femme fatale in this particular depiction, um, especially because she's in the middle of, of cutting his head off. And of course, Holofernes has woken up to realize what's going on, and you see the, the incredible expression on his face. You can almost, it's almost palpable, the, the pain that you see. Now, a follower of Car Caravaggio, or a Caravaggisti, um, is Artemisia Gentileschi. Arguably the most famous depiction of the story of Judith and Holofernes um, comes from this artist. So she paints this subject matter a number of times. She is often, you know, she's often considered a follower of Caravaggio, and she was also a Baroque artist. So she, she uses all of the same stylistic elements, harsh lighting, rich colors, depicting things as a height of drama. So all of those check, those boxes are checked. So many scholars believe that Judith, that I'm sorry, uh, Artemisia used herself as a model for Judith. And she has several self-portraits, and there is a there is a resemblance. But she may have used herself as a as the, the image for Judith, and she may have channeled her own rage um, and her emotions into this painting as the protagonist. So notice how forceful Judith is in this in this image. I when I would teach art history, I always show these two paintings back to back because. Um, you can kind of feel the rage. Whereas Caravaggio's Judith is cutting through uh, Holofernes' head very easily. <laughs> you know, she doesn't seem to be struggling a lot. She is, she is aggressive. And there's potentially, there's potentially a reason for that. Um, so Caravaggio's image seems as if she's kind of disgusted with the act, but it's relatively simple and she's just getting the task over with. But this was painted after a really traumatic moment in the life of Artemisia Gentileschi. And so perhaps her feelings at the time were placed on this painting. So just a very quick bio of her and why this might be. She was sexually assaulted by her painting teacher. And when she was called to testify in the case, they wanted to make sure that she wasn't lying. And so they used torture elements to make sure she was telling the truth. So this woman had recently been traumatized a number of times. And this was painted shortly after that trial. And so it's not surprising, perhaps, to see the level of kind of effort that Judith is putting into that motion. So this remains one of the most violent images of the beheading of Holofernes. So she was so connected to this story, and I think she really, you know, felt the, felt the rage. Um, she painted it a couple different times. So this one is in the uh, Uffizi in Florence, um, and this one is in Naples. Um, and this is almost the exact same composition you look at the two of them. One of them has been cropped a little and their clothing is a different color, but the same idea here. Now, I'll talk about this one more in detail because I think you can see the blood a little better. She's very, very uh, specific about the, the gore, the blood that's coming from his neck feels much more real than kind of the spray of bright red ribbons that almost come out of uh, Caravaggio's <laughs> painting. Notice it kind of dripping off of the bed. She took great measure to create an accurate, or what we think might be an accurate image. Um, 
and Holofernes uh, is fighting back. Look at his fist as he's pushing up to try to push away. His fist is about the same size as the maidservant's face. So she's reinforcing the power of this man, but also the power of this woman. And then this is another Polyp Judith and Holofernes by Artemisia Gentileschi, and uh, depicting the moments after. So the last two paintings, again, that height of drama. This one is after. We know she's been successful at killing Holofernes, but she's going to get away with it. So she still heightens the drama with kind of her having her hand in front of the candle and both Judith and her maidservant looking off to the side. You almost look at this and think, oh no. Did they hear a twig snap? Did they hear someone walk by? So that drama of the Baroque period is still here. Now, many of you have probably seen this if you've been to the DIA. Um, if not, this is at the Detroit Institute of Art, so it's a, it's a close student. So timeline-wise, from what we've talked about today, this is where Lazzarini falls in. He is, his, paint, his painting comes after, Caravaggio and Gentileschi, and you can still see some of that drama. We already kind of talked a little bit about what he, how he amps up the drama. And then the, the last uh, Judith that we'll look at before we quickly return to Lazzarini is Gustav Klimt. So after the Baroque period, the depictions of Judith in the history of art kind of slow down. You don't see as many of them. Other topics take over. Um, it lost, loses its popularity until the 19th and 20th century. We start to see a little resurgence. Um, Gustav Klimt's version of Judith is not necessarily, at least I would argue, not aggressive or revengeful. She is perhaps more of the seductive, sensual, mysterious femme fatale, as opposed to the femme forte or the, the violent you know, assassin. In this image, you really almost don't even see Holofernes. You know, when, if you, when you looked at this, did your eyes go directly to him, or did you look at her? Clint really wants us to focus on Judith. And, of course, the beautiful gold accents and elements draw your eye around the painting, but it's, her expression is so um, powerful that you really focus on her. You focus on her expression, her face, her chest, and her beauty. And then Holofernes is kind of tucked off to the side. But he wanted us to make sure that we knew who it was, so I, you can see it at the very top. <laughs> he's, he's told us, this is Judith and Holofernes. But it's a different depiction. She's kind of looking out seductively at the viewer. And um, it's, it's the same story, but at a different moment and painted in a different way. So those are just a handful. You can find many, many, many others online if you want to search. Um, but bringing this back to Lazzarini, the painting of the FIA falls shortly after, as I said, Caravaggio and Gentileschi. And he's embracing some of those Baroque ideas, but he also has some kind of classical elements. Rich colors are similar to the artists that we saw before. He uses the blue that kind of connects us to the Virgin Mary. Her clothing is not the height of fashion at the time, but it is not like Matanya, which his painting was very, very classical. Her clothing kind of falls somewhere in between, so it's almost timeless. There's something very powerful about our Judith, and something very beautiful about her as well. So I would argue that she falls somewhere in between that femme forte and femme fatale. And um, I'd love to hear interpretations, of course, but I think Lazzarini's painting is, it kind of encompasses a lot of all of the other types that we've looked at today. So it creates this really dynamic depiction of a really powerful woman in the history of art and in the story of Judah. So thank you very much. I'm open for questions.
You all excited to go down and, and check her out? Maybe up close? Question. Uh, yes. The one where um, it, it's very brief. God is the one. This one? No, the next one. That one. Mm -hmm. Is that the same artist that did um, the birth of Venus? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Bertha Venus and um, his other really famous painting is uh, Primavera, so the okay. spring. Uh, and you can, you know, some similarity. Yes. In the body as, as the Bertha Venus. Exactly. He might have used the same model. Um, the Bertha Venus looks a little bit different, but he loved, he found a model and he stuck with her for most of his career. Um, yeah, it's interesting how some artists have a very, very particular style. And regardless of what they paint, you can kind of pinpoint their, their artwork. I'm just glad I pinpointed Yeah, you got it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm giving myself a gold star. <laughs> On the previous um, slide, the, oh, sorry, no, not the other, that one right yes. there. Is the sword broken? It looks broken. It looks broken. Mm -hmm. um, I, don't, I don't know too much about um, weaponry. Uh, to know if that's a particular type of sword with a blunt end, but it looks broken, but I don't see any, I don't see the other part of it. Yeah. So uh, I actually might say is he meant it that way. Like it's a, maybe just a particular type of sword. Because you would usually maybe see the broken end. Yeah. Yeah. But very cool image, you know, very, it's also again very stylistic of Montana. Are there depictions after Clint? I don't know of any, but. So there are, um, there, in terms of like the more famous images, one of them that I didn't put up here, um, but is really, really interesting and a totally different kind of take. And I didn't include it because it's very different. The story is the same concept, but it's a very different image, which is um, a contemporary artist named Kahindi Wiley. And his painting of Judith and Holofernes is a African-American woman in a very, very contemporary dress, kind of like Frank the Elder. And instead of holding a man's head, she's holding a white woman's head. So it talks about the issues between, you know, historical racism between white women and black, against black women. And so it's a very powerful image. I think he actually has two. But other than that, um, there are a handful of other ones that are around the same time as Klimt, but it kind of falls off in popularity, probably in part because we don't see as much religious imagery in the 20th and 21st century. Yeah. You have to wish Salvador, Salvador Dali had come. Oh my gosh, I can only imagine. <laughs> yes. When did the book of Judith surface? When did we first know it? Um, I think it was the second century. Well, that's when it was said it was written, it was in the second century. Um, I don't, I have to imagine it around then, but I don't know exactly. But, it, but when I was researching this, it was kind of interesting. So, so some of the reasons it's left out of some Bibles is because if you look at it in terms of timeline, it doesn't fit with some other biblical texts. And so there is some suggestion that maybe it's more like a parable than an actual moment. Is there art of her before the Renaissance? In the medieval period, there the is. Yeah, period. I didn't yeah. include any of it. It was a little bit harder to find. Yeah. Yes. To the clip, which I think is very disturbing. Yes. Is he, do we have any paper trail of him talking about it or writing about it? Uh, not that I know of, but. Uh, I I wouldn't be surprised if there was because he did he does he does talk about it a lot and I don't know who the model is but she reoccurs in his artwork um, I don't think it's Elena Blancauer I think it's another model but that's a that would be a good art history deep dive for me to see it's very disturbing yes uh, a little later on there is a motion picture version it's called Judith of Bethulia. And another coincidence, I think it was produced in 1913. I think it's really cool that we're kind of doing this on the 100th anniversary of that. Oh, that's so cool. I did not know that. <laughs> that's great. I, I tend to focus right on the visual art, and then everything else is, is I don't know about. That's awesome. Yes. It's interesting with the um, 
current events with Israel yes. being attacked. Yep. Right now. Yeah, very much. Any other questions, comments? Yes. I was just wondering about the position of the pearl on the one that is here currently. Mm -hmm. yeah. Because you know, normally the pearls are intact, and um, you mentioned that maybe the artist did a sort of a visual line or something, mm -hmm. but is there anything else to indicate that, you know, another reason, like that they were broken? Right. Or Don't, I have to go down and like get really close because I don't remember any of them like on the floor, like loose pearls on the floor, which would indicate that it's ripped off. Um, but I would actually say that that probably, if we're, we're thinking of this as a, as a story, I would say that maybe he woke up and, and tried to defend himself. But um, I don't think that they're, that it's like obviously broken. Um, but I would I would say that that's probably why because that, that's not a jewelry style that would have been yeah it's just an interesting yeah mm -hmm. yep all right well thank you all for coming thank you. I love talking about Judith so I was very excited <laughs> for today um, but have a wonderful day um, if you haven't seen the the artwork feel free to walk out of the gallery and check it out. And December 12th is our next copy of the curate.